Hello, and welcome to our webinar on interdisciplinary care of post-COVID-19 patients with Parkinson's disease, considerations and resources. We are delighted to have each of you joining us live and extend our welcome to those of you who may be viewing this at a later date on demand. We have a presentation that is packed full of information, so I'm going to uh, get moving right to it. We have a wonderful panel of presenters here with us today, and I'd like to introduce you to them, starting with Heather Hodges. Heather is uh, one of our LSVT Loud faculty and clinical experts. She's also our ASHA CE coordinator, and she specializes in diagnosing and treating upper airway disorders and swallowing disorders in adult and pediatric populations. We have Patricia, Dr. Patricia Brown. She is a physical therapist, and I may have failed to mention Heather is a speech language pathologist. Uh, Dr. Brown is a physical therapist. She's a clinical assistant professor um, for the physical therapy program at Chapman University. She's one of our LSVT big faculty, and she's a highly experienced physical therapist with extensive um, experience working with people with Parkinson's disease. We have a Dr. Amy Ramage, also a speech language pathologist. Amy is an assistant professor and research coordinator in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at the University of New Hampshire. Her area of expertise and research is on the association between impairments of cognition, emotion, and language in neurogenic communication disorders and the brain systems that underlie them. Next up, we have Julia Wood. Julia is a occupational therapist. She's also one of our LSVT big training and certification faculty. Julia is a highly experienced occupational therapist who specializes in treating people with movement disorders at the Dan Aaron Parkinson's Rehabilitation Center in Philadelphia. We also have Dr. Jessica Galgano, another speech language pathologist. She's Executive Director of Open Line Speech and Communication and an LSVT Loud faculty and our clinical expert. Jessica is also faculty instructor at NYU Langone School of Medicine and an adjunct professor at San Francisco State University. I am Cynthia Fox, uh, CEO and one of the co-founders of LSVT Global. And along with my colleague, Laura Gousset, who's our Chief Clinical Officer of LSVT Big, we will be moderating this presentation um, for you today. These are the uh, more detailed biographies of our presenters. I will not read through those now, but you'll have them for reference and for CE reporting. In terms of disclosures, all presenters have both financial and non-financial relationships with LSVT Global. Non-financial include a preference for LSVT as treatment techniques. In terms of financial, myself, I'm an employee of LSVT Global, receive lecture honorarium and have ownership interest. Ms. Hodges and Ms. Gousset are employees of LSVT Global and receive lecture honorarium. Doctors Galgano, Brown, and Ramage, and Ms. Wood receive lecture honorarium. So our plan is to uh, present our purpose. Uh, we'll go through some key logistics. We'll present the core content of the presentation. We'll have a good chunk of time at the end for questions. And then as you close out of the webinar, there'll be a very short survey that we encourage you to take. It's at that time that you'll be able to request a certificate for self-reporting CEUs as well. In the handout that you should have received in an email about one hour before the start of the presentation, or you can download it from your control panel right in the webinar, um, are the slides that are presented here today. There's also a beautiful reference list, 70 references at the end of that handout, as well as links to many additional resources. So one of our goals is to uh, share what we can in this short amount of time, but also arm you with a number of resources that you can use after the fact. If for some reason you did not get the handout, we can certainly email it to you after the presentation. In terms of CE activity, this webinar is not ASHA or state registered for CEUs for speech, physical, or occupational therapy professionals, but 
It may be used for self-reported CE credit as non-registered and non-pre-approved CE activity. That is, it can count towards your CE maintenance progress if you choose to self-report the activity. So again, in the survey, you'll have an opportunity to request a certificate, which will include your name, date of the webinar, and number of hours earned. Please be patient. It may take uh, one to two weeks to get that emailed to you. For live viewers, the certificates will automatically be sent if you request it in the survey. If you're viewing this on demand, you may request a certificate by emailing us at webinars at lsvtglobal.com or forward the post webinar email. And attendance at the full webinar is required. Licensing requirements for CEUs differ by state. Check with your own PTOT or speech licensing boards to determine if they accept self-reported CEUs. For more information on non-ASHA CEUs, there is a web link for you. And just to reiterate, completion of the webinar will not be reported by us to the CE registry. It is your responsibility to retain the documentation just as you would do with any other non-registered CE activity. At any time during the presentation, you can type in a question. So if the question comes in your mind, uh, in your question chat box there, you can type it in. We'll answer them at the end. Um, we'll also go over the process for question answering questions at the very end. And at any time, if a question comes to you in the future, you can email us at webinars at lsvtglobal.com. So the learning objectives for our presentation are as follows. We want to summarize the potential impact of COVID-19 on speech, respiratory, musculoskeletal, and central peripheral nervous systems for people with Parkinson's disease. We'll then discuss cognitive changes post COVID-19 and some strategies to evaluate and treat across disciplines, speech PT, OT. We'll explain rehabilitation and prehabilitation considerations for people who've recovered from COVID-19 across this range of severity of how they have recovered. We'll discuss some special considerations for LSVT loud or LSVT big treatment and that may be for a new client, somebody who's continuing treatment, or a graduate who might need tune-ups or uh, treatment again post COVID-19 recovery. And finally, provide you with a number of resources for more information on post COVID-19 related care. What we'd like to do now is learn a little bit more about who's in our audience. So I'm going to launch a poll that will ask you who you are, will pop up here in just a moment. And you can just take a moment to select who you are. And once we have a high percentage of people who have voted, we will look at the exciting responses. Okay, I think that most people have shared. And so now you can see we have a nice range. We have 39% speech therapists, 57% physical occupational therapists, so 2% other health professionals, and 1% um, people with Parkinson's or perhaps family members. So again, thank you all for joining us today. We are happy to have you. Let me get us back to our slides. Okay, I'm going to take just a few moments to set the stage before I turn it over to the experts. And so Parkinson disease and COVID-19. Um, obviously, Parkinson disease is a complex neurological disorder. We know we have many motor and non-motor symptoms that individuals are dealing with that already put them um, sometimes at challenges for communication, swallowing, movement, activities of daily living. And, you know, one question, are people with Parkinson's disease inherently more susceptible to COVID-19? At this time, there are not enough data to know the answer to that. But I think we can all probably agree, as a group, they're likely more vulnerable and maybe at greater risk for complications, simply due to potential advancing age, underlying comorbidities, and advanced disease severity. Now, while the, the focus of today is for people who have been infected with COVID and recovered, we know that the impact of COVID-19 
also has an impact on people who've not been affected. And there's certainly an amount of psychological stress, anxiety, isolation, uncertainty that I think we're all feeling um, in these uncertain times. There's reduced access to direct medical care. Um, of concern to us is the reduction of physical and social activity, the inability perhaps to, to attend speech, physical and occupational therapies, exercise groups, socialization outside of the home, and these all can have indirect consequences that can exacerbate symptoms for people with Parkinson disease. Our focus today is to think about the patients who have had COVID-19, have been affected, and have recovered, so looking at the post-acute phase. Very limited data, specifically on people with Parkinson disease. Um, new things are coming out, as we know, every single day. One of the first reports was 10 clinical, clinical cases by Antonini and colleagues. These were cases from both Italy and the UK. And the patients of older age with longer disease duration um, may be more susceptible to COVID-19 with higher mortality rates. That is, uh, four of the 10 clinical cases did not survive. Of those on advanced therapies, um, DBS, levodopad infusion, they may be even more vulnerable. So of those four cases on advanced therapies, 50% uh, mortality rate. We know that with Parkinson disease, it already requires rehabilitation services, but how, do, how does that change post-COVID-19 recovery? Um, and that's a big focus of what we'll talk upon. Um, just some high level, we know there's a risk perhaps for worse respiratory complications due to pre-existing weak cough, chest wall rigidity, pre-existing dyspnea, stress, self-isolation, anxiety, and also the prolonged potential immobility due to hospitalization, isolation, and extreme inactivity. So this is a novel situation we're in. And our goal is to begin the conversation of the post-acute phase, how best to help people with Parkinson's rehabilitate from COVID-19. We're learning more, but there are so many unknowns. How might recovery differ in a person with Parkinson's disease? For those who survive, how can we help them to safely recover? How do we keep ourselves safe in the process? So see today's presentation as just a tip of the iceberg. This is ultimately an ongoing discussion, um, but interdisciplinary care may be more important than ever. What's our unique role in this population? How can we work together? And, and our interdisciplinary team is not the full team here today. We've really taken the rehab team, the speech PT OT colleagues. So what are considerations as well and opportunities related to Parkinson's specific intensive interventions? And we'll focus on the examples of LSVT loud and LSVT big. When might they be able to uh, get back to treatment or start treatment if they've recovered from COVID-19? So with that introduction now, I am going to turn it over to our part one which is the system's impact of COVID-19. This section will be presented by Heather Hodges and Dr. Patricia Brown, and Heather will be taking the first segment. So Heather, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Fox. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to speak on this topic. And so we will be covering first the speech and swallowing systems, as well as respiratory system and how that may affect um, not only um, communication, but also may affect your interaction and how you are screening your patients. And then um, Dr. Brown will um, also be speaking to the respiratory system because it is um, impactful when it comes to speech therapy and also to physical and occupational therapy. And we'll discuss the cardiovascular pulmonary systems. Uh, she'll get into grid um, detail with the musculoskeletal system, and we'll discuss the central and peripheral nervous systems. So we will jump first into speech. And so I do want to point out that in these slides, when we talk about the incidences, um, the incidences reported in this presentation are extrapolated from studies on similar populations. And we acknowledge that the numbers on post-COVID patients are not well established as one, the disease and its effects are still being studied. And two, 
ENT exams and instrumental exams of swallowing are not being completed due to their high transmission risk from airborne droplets from the patient. And we also acknowledge that there is a wide range of severities and presentations of COVID-19. So the considerations and presentations we'll be talking about are going to be when you are working with patients who span that spectrum, who've had mild presentations of COVID-19 and its effects, as well as those who had severe impact. Um, a, physician out of Johns Hopkins Medical Center noted that the respiratory system, of course, this is a respiratory disease, um, the recovery from the damage is really going to take time. There's, of course, that initial injury to the lungs, um, and that initial injury translates into scarring. Over time, the tissue may heal. Um, there are certainly cases, uh, perhaps folks who've had underlying pulmonary disease where that, that healing process may be interrupted um, or stunted, but in those, even without prior pulmonary involvement, it may take three months, perhaps a year or more for a person's lung function to return to pre-COVID-19 levels. And so when you see your patients, you may notice that there's increased dyspnea across the severity levels. And for those more severe manifestations of COVID-19, those folks who've had pneumonia, lung scarring, um, ARDS or sepsis, you can certainly look for more of a long-term healing impact on the respiratory system. And thus, you may need to adjust your um, clinical expectations and treatment um, as such. Um, decreased vital capacity, uh, impaired breathing and coordination um, if they've been on a ventilator. And even in those patients that you're seeing face-to-face, -face, uh, wearing a mask during your evaluation or treatment will also impact their breath support. So certainly the, the range of impact is there, but I think knowing that the respiratory system will have a major impact is important. So Consult and collaborate with the pulmonary team. Um, if, you're, if your patient has a pulmonologist, um, one on board, or if you have one at your center that you're able to run ideas be, uh, by, um, consult with respiratory therapy and physical therapy on the appropriateness perhaps of inspiratory muscle training, expiratory muscle training, uh, use of inspiration spirometry as part of your treatment plans perhaps for uh, your dysphagia patients would be examples. And as we continue to look within the system, uh, we'll move on to the laryngeal impact. So again, we're seeing an impact across severity levels. I'm seeing in the literature coming out, but also in informal places such as um, social media, speech therapy groups or, or pages where therapists are noting that they're COVID patients are reporting symptoms of chronic cough, throat clearing, um, paradoxical vocal fold motion, um, signs and symptoms, upper airway irritation and reactivity. Also, they are reporting dysphonia related to their COVID-19 that may be in addition to the baseline dysphonia that someone who has Parkinson's disease-related dysphonia may have. A multi-study study review in the Critical Care um, Medicine Journal noted that post-intubation with mechanical ventilation, 83% of those patients had laryngeal injury. Many of those injuries were mild, but there were more severe or moderately severe injuries in up to 31% of the patients across the studies that they looked at. The most frequently occurring clinical symptoms reported after an extubation was dysphonia, pain, hoarseness, and dysphagia. So we really are looking at all the systems when, from, from the bottom, from the respiratory, up through the laryngeal and beyond. Of course, it would be nice if when we see our patients, they came to us with an ENT exam, but we know that ENT exams 
as I mentioned, are, are being halted or in some places they may be slowly starting to be phased back in. Um, but there's a nice statement on the ASHA website for how to handle this situation during the COVID-19 crisis and how the framework of determining the appropriateness and balancing the necessary or necessity for your patients on and their risk on a case-by-case -case basis. So we have those resources um, in your handout and also that will be shared with you at the end here. So consult and collaborate with your ENT departments, the referring physician on what they know about how the intubation and extubation occurred. Was there, was it traumatic? Was there any difficulty intubating or extubating? Those will give you ideas for the degree of, or possible injury that there is versus just a laryngeal irritation. Um, you may also reference the ASHA code of ethics and your state laws and regula regulations and ensuring that the facilities and clinics that you work in um, really get well-established protocols for ENT exams and in the absence of an ENT exam, what that looks like for your evaluation of treatment during this COVID-19 pandemic. When we look at swallowing, we know that even non-COVID patients who've been extubated have higher um, incidence of dysphagia. So it may range in the mild degree for patients who have difficulty coordinating their breathing and swallowing um, pattern that we, we need as we masticate, as we swallow. And so that can certainly affect um, uh, the safety of the swallow and may also have an impact of the dyspnea and cough that's associated with COVID-19 um, and can also interrupt the coordination of breathing and swallowing. If you are noticing that your patients are uh, with an increased breathing rate of more than 25 breaths per minute, the research on non-COVID patients knows that this heightens the dysphagia risk. And so looking at these incidences of iatrogenic dysphagia secondary to prolonged intubation or to traumatic um, intubation, we see that there's delayed swallow, atrophy and sensory deficits uh, post prolonged intubation. And we know that people who are intubated as a result of COVID-19, many of them are, are being intubated for long periods of time when the data suggests that 25 to about 68% of dysphagia occurs in those intubated longer than two days, we can certainly um, uh, extrapolate that those patients with COVID-19 who are being intubated for weeks um, certainly are going to need swallow assessment. And in those uh, who are over 65 years old, they are at an increased risk of silent aspiration. We also know that those patients with Parkinson disease have increased incidence of aspiration. So things that are, are very important to keep in mind as we keep our patients safe and to ensure that we are really evaluating the whole person when our patients come back for speech therapy. So consult and collaborate. There are many reasons for a cough. It may be uh, to expectorate. It might be secretion management. Um, airway protection in the case of aspiration. It can also, uh, cough may be due to just laryngeal irritation or more of a chronic cough syndrome. So treat accordingly. And if necessary, for those who need to expectorate, consult with respiratory therapy. In my practice working with patients with respiratory diseases, um, use, use of a huff cough or collaborating with the respiratory therapy on consultations to learn a cappella valve uh, to increase the efficiency of expectoration while trying to reduce the potential laryngeal trauma from that necessary productive cough. And then, of course, those means for controlling a dry chronic cough after. Um, a laryngeal irritation event such as intubation or illness. All right, we also take into account the neurological changes. 
Neurological changes have been documented in COVID-19 with or without respiratory symptoms. And it's important to point out that these symptoms can overlap greatly with those uh, symptoms that patients with Parkinson disease have. So if you are seeing a patient and they're reporting a loss of smell, um, muscle weakness, et cetera, and if that heightens your concern that they may be contagious or have COVID-19, it's good to know what overlaps uh, with Parkinson disease. And so here's a nice list. The loss of smell, inability to taste, muscle weakness, tingling or numbness in the hands and feet, dizziness, confusion. All of those can occur with COVID-19 patients, but can also occur uh, for those patients with Parkinson disease. The mechanism for these neurological changes are not, is not yet known. It might be the virus in, itself, or it may be the inflammation that the virus causes, or perhaps changes in O2 and CO2 levels causing the confusion, dizziness, et cetera. They, the patients may also experience delirium, seizures, and stroke. There is a greater than expected number of younger patients being hospitalized for and sometimes dying from serious strokes. And these strokes are happening in patients who test positive for coronavirus, but who don't have any traditional risk factors for stroke. So it's been happening in younger patients who don't have uh, risk factors such as high blood pressure or obesity. These individuals tend to not have COVID-19 symptoms, the traditional ones, so the respiratory symptoms, or maybe they only have mild symptoms of COVID-19. And um, so that's it's important for us as we look at the whole person and as we start getting referrals for these patients to come see speech therapy that they may be quite complex. They may have these multiple system impacts that go beyond just respiratory and laryngeal. So it's um, uh, also key to know that uh, these strokes are, are happening due to blood clotting issues. And so whether the blood clots cause a stroke or not, they may also form pulmonary embolisms. So it's important to know that a patient who's suffered a pulmonary embolism can also have a shortness of breath, chest pain. You can die from them as well, but if the patients are post-covery COVID and they've had a pulmonary embolism without a stroke, you may further anticipate that their respiratory systems will be impacted more greatly and may be uh, those that take longer to recover, even in, in 40 something year old patients who you would expect may recover faster with their respiratory um, systems impact, you, you might not see that uh, occur with the pulmonary embolism cases. All right, so when we look at the collective impact on communication, Looking at all of these, these systems together, patients can have a weak voice when they present to you, and that weak voice may be in addition to Parkinson's disease and exacerbated by laryngeal trauma. That laryngeal trauma may range from upper airway irritation to a chronic dry cough or even be a post-intubation injury. Weak voice also exacerbated by reduced respiratory support or even by patients who are proactively wearing masks in your sessions, especially as we get back to more face-to-face -face sessions and not solely working with people over telehealth. That's a reality for us to, uh, to consider. And so what does that look like when you are assessing your patients, um, knowing that that certainly can make an impact? Fatigue. Our patients who have had COVID-19, uh, so that can be a long road to recovery. And so fatigue may present as apathy or a lack of interest in communication. And then those cognitive challenges, being disoriented, maybe having more difficulty focusing, 
um, and cognitive challenges uh, will be discussed later in more detail. But it's important too, as we think about our patients with Parkinson's who perhaps don't need intervention on these other systems and are ready to start LSVT loud, that difficulty to focus is all the more reason to have your one single treatment target, which LSVT loud certainly provides us with the, the, the cue of loudness. We know that difficulty with communication affects all aspects of their recovery and rehabilitation, physical, mental, and social. And so if you are at your clinic and you receive a referral from a physician and the order simply states, post-COVID admission, eval, and treat, here is what I would first consider in my consult with this patient. So not knowing them at all, they come to us blind. It's a very, very simplistic order that the physician has given you. Looking at clinical swallowing exam, exam within, within your time with them. So that might include chart and labs review. Um, if appropriate and if cleared by your facility and your state, um, oral MEC exams, um, a cranial nerve assessment, and also looking at the national dysphagia diet levels with your patient. Were they placed on a different diet when they were hospitalized? Um, and laryngeal assessment, assessing their voice for dysphonia. Um, if it's a patient that you have seen before, is their dysphonia changed or different from their baseline? when you first met them. In the laryngeal assessment, I would include questioning them about upper airway and irritable larynx signs and symptoms, such as um, strider, throat tightness, pain, odynophagia, um, chronic cough, chronic throat clearing, et cetera. In a ideal, you know, perfect world that, you know, when we see our patients, Previous to this pandemic, we were able to have a modified barium swallow study if we were suspicious of a dysphagia. We were able to have an ENT exam, but now we're really coming at this with the point of view of having limited access to instrumental evaluations at this time. And so as states are starting to open back up, some instrumental evaluations may begin to be available once again. And again, just consulting with the state and your facility for guidance. In the meantime, further non-instrumental screenings can include the respiratory signs and symptoms, such as their breathing rate. As I mentioned before, a high breathing rate can impact the risk for dysphagia, their breath support for speech, the PBFM or um, inducible laryngeal obstruction signs and symptoms, and inspiratory and expiratory strength. Um, and that's where some, some of the, the approaches for PVFM to include inspiratory muscle strength training or for dysphagia management to include expiratory strength muscle training may be part of your treatment plan moving forward if you reveal um, a deficit. If your patients did have a stroke as a result of COVID-19, you may be doing cognitive, linguistic, and also strength screenings. And so there will be more information later in this lecture on the cognitive and linguistic components that we can evaluate and treat. So differentiation of cause, how do you tell if the problem is related to Parkinson's disease, COVID-19, or a combination? I would start with the interview. When a new patient comes to you or a known patient returns post-COVID-19, there is a wide range of manifestations across the speech and body. It may be difficult to judge if it's solely due to Parkinson's disease, slowly, solely due to COVID-19, and in that interview, I would be asking those patients about their status prior to their COVID-19 infection. Were they hospitalized versus not hospitalized? Did they have any complications? 
Um, were there things that the patient was able to do before COVID-19 infection that now they find difficult or cannot do at all? And simply asking them what has changed as a result of COVID-19. That can help parse out what the deficits that you are seeing are related to. In all likelihood, it may be a combination of Parkinson's disease and COVID-19. Um, so you can also ask some of those previously mentioned screening questions regarding dysphagia, cough, upper airway irritation or dyspnea, new cognitive or word finding issues. If they are reporting that they don't have any changes and maybe you've met them at, a, at an assessment before they were hospitalized and you don't notice any signs or symptoms on the screening, then it may be more of a traditional straightforward LSVT loud patient. Um, if they have other sequela, then you may be seeing them for a longer treatment course. And so you'll have to use your clinical judgment too in those patients who have multiple effects of prioritizing or triaging those deficits and what you would treat first. Would it be LSVT loud uh, versus dysphagia versus laryngeal injury, upper airway disorders versus cognition? Or maybe in some patients, you need to work on improving breath support for speech prior to LSVT loud if they are severely deconditioned or need inspiratory muscle training or breathing coordination work. We do also know that LSVT loud has great data regarding respiratory kinematics. So it may be appropriate to proceed with just LSVT loud and see how things improve and to continually use your clinical judgment and your clinical assessment as you move forward with uh, your, your treatment plan and, and with your patients. And so with that overview of the speech systems and how those may be affected, how to evaluate and start planning your care for those patients, I want to now turn it over to my colleague Patricia Brown, who will discuss more of the um, LSVT big side of things and the physical therapy side of the manifestations. Thank you, Heather. And um, th that was very interesting. I learned a lot, so I appreciate that. I wanted to start by just saying that our role in, in physical and occupational th and speech therapy in general um, in is available to help prevent decline in people who have experienced COVID-19 and are discharged from the hospital. So uh, either through tune-ups or through an initial start of LSVT big, um, we can actually utilize some of the tools to help prevent that decline. Because the literature has shown, and this is not specific to, to people with Parkinson, but 20% of those that have been recently discharged from an acute care hospital are readmitted within 30 days. So um, um, a therapy role can be very important to help prevent that readmission. Um, and one of the risk, risk factors, or some of the main risk factors for readmission are physical problems and impairments and, and functional activities that are impaired and impaired ADLs. Uh, obviously, the things that we focus on in physical, occupational, and speech therapy. Um, the other role that we could play to help prevent decline is doing assessments of home um, and their access to and their equipment and their durable medical equipment to make certain that they're able to stay as mobile as they can so that they do prevent that decline. And these, these, this prevention of decline isn't only those who've been discharged from the hospital, but even those maybe who are in the community with Parkinson's and maybe end up some people we, as we know, we've all heard in the news, have very mild symptoms or um, minimal symptoms. And we also need to make certain that we're addressing that and that we work on prevention of decline from those that population as well. Um, but use of the maximal daily exercises that we do in LSVT Big and the functional component task, task can help maintain and increase a patient's functional reserve. And um, 
uh, I know for a fact that some uh, a Parkinson's gym that I work with, we just uh, started an LSVT Big for Life class so that those people who um, are, don't have COVID, we want to maintain that um, functional reserve and try to improve it a little bit. So if they were to eventually get COVID down the future, the reserve would be even that much better. Um, the other role that we have in therapy is that, and, and this is something I really can't stress enough, is that we are the eyes and ears for signs and symptoms for people who come out post-COVID, um, whether they were hospitalized or not, we're the eyes and ears for physicians and nurses and, and pulmonologists to, to let them know if we start to see any signs or symptoms that are concerning, um, whether they're concerning uh, symptoms, signs and symptoms of COVID or any other functional decline. As you know, we in therapy spend so much more time with our patients than often a physician has uh, opportunity to do. So um, being that eyes and ears, and then as we're working with our patients, we want to keep in mind the risk to benefit ratio. So I know that some care during this pandemic has had to be limited due to concern for spread of the, the disease. However, at some point we need to look at the risk versus benefit, especially in those vulnerable populations that if you aren't active and you withhold activity, um, eventually that is potential a risk for decline. So as you're doing with any treatment that you do as a, as a clinician, you always want to keep in mind that risk to benefit ratio and why we would need to, to focus on that. Okay, so I kind of set up this next section um, focusing on two different um, aspects. One is the subjective exam, things you might look at by talking to the patient and doing your subjective exam, doing your review of systems that occurs during that, and all the different systems that you see listed on the slide here, endocrine, EENT, the um, gastrointestinal, um, GU system, the, um, the, the blood and lymphatic system, the psychological and emotional, which is technically not a system, but still an area that we should definitely um, ask about, um, um, cardiovascular, pulmonary, neuromuscular, integumentary, and musculoskeletal are all things that um, could potentially be impacted in one way or another by um, um, Parkinson's or non motor or non-motor symptoms or by COVID. So we want to definitely keep those things in mind as we're working with our patients and we're asking them these symptoms um, within these systems. And then, although we're not going to touch on all of those today, we're going to focus on um, just a few of the main systems. The other area that I focused on in the slides is actually the physical examination and what to consider or keep in mind in those patients that are possibly post-COVID. Um, and that would be your systems review. And the, four, the three main areas we're going to talk about is cardiovascular pulmonary, neuromuscular, and musculoskeletal. But we would be remiss in not talking about a little bit about the integumentary system, especially in those patients who are prolonged in intensive care or hospitalization involved in proning or those sorts of things where often there is integumentary pressure injury. So we have to consider those as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the cardiovascular and pulmonary um, um, things that system that your review is system, things you're going to ask that patient. So some uh, of the literature has indicated that there are multiple different cardiovascular signs or, or symptoms and problems that uh, can be caused by COVID. Now, these aren't specific to Parkinson's disease. These are general to COVID, but definitely um, a person with Parkinson's disease could potentially get these as well. So you want to definitely be on the lookout for these. And so you want to know if they had any new uh, arrhythmia by asking about an irregular heartbeat. Did anyone tell you have an irregular heartbeat? while you were in the hospital or have you ever been told that? Um, I think it's, uh, there have been cases where heart failure was one of the issues uh, presented with COVID, especially in severe multi-system failure cases. And um, we would wanna ask a patient, have they had an increase in swelling in their feet or get weight gain? Um, so maybe a patient has a mild case of COVID and they hadn't been hospitalized, but they happen to report to you that, oh, you know, I have noticed more swelling and I have noticed I put on, you know, seven pounds in the last week or something like that. So we definitely need to, to be screening that and keep that in the back of our mind when we're talking to our patients. 
Um, there have been cases that have uh, experienced an MI, um, a, a, a heart attack, basically. So you want to ask if they were hospitalized, if they had any um, trouble with a heart attack while we're in, in there. Um, the enlargement of the heart and um, cardiac arrest, um, coagulopathy is a problem that can occur. And we'll talk more about um, hypercoagulation that is a, a, an issue with this um, post -co with COVID-19 uh, as a whole. And um, those are definitely things to consider. And I don't know if your patient would actually know if they had those things, but um, they would know if they had a cardiac arrest, I'm, cer I'm certain. Um, their family would share that with them if they survived that. But you want to definitely keep those things in mind as you're thinking about what you need to be screening um, and uh, examining with your patients. The next one, hyper or hypotension, as you know, with Parkinson's disease, this is an area that is often a challenge in this population um already um so they there have patients have experienced post covid or during covid um infection both hyper and hypotension um issues there's a lot of trouble with regulating blood pressure so um that would be something that we would definitely need to ask did you have any trouble with did you have any really high blood pressure did you have super low pressure outside of the norm of what you normally experience. And just as Heather mentioned that you want to ask about what their symptoms were before, if you're not familiar with them, you would want to ask them, are you someone who has trouble with your blood pressure dropping really low throughout the day, that sort of thing. Um, if you could ask about lab values, one of the lab values um, it, that is showing to be very important is the elevated D-dimer. And that lab value looks at the amount of uh, fibr fibrous um, tissue in the blood that helps to form blood clots. And they have find that that's often elevated and they know that just as um, Heather mentioned, the risk of clotting and potential stroke uh, uh, is definitely a real um, challenge with this pop with post-COVID and potentially can lead to um, ischemic um, stroke incidences. So we definitely want to, to keep that in mind. So if you can ask about lab values or the recent lab values, that would be helpful if you have access to that. Oftentimes patients will have access to their most current lab values. Sometimes they won't. It just depends on the, on the environment that you're practicing in. Um, the other one is some, sometimes they uh, have a prolonged prothrombin time and you want to ask if they're taking any blood thinners because um, that is something that you're going to need to look out for. Um, that might be if they're taking blood thinners, perhaps maybe they did have a blood coagulation issue while in the hospital and maybe had a PE or a, a pulmonary embolus or a, a, a um, DVT, a venous thrombus. So keep that in mind. Okay. So in people with Parkinson's disease, um, specifically, the literature has shown that um, they're definitely the orthostatic hypotension and fatigue is specifically worsened post-COVID. So we already kind of touched a little bit on the um, hypotension, but make certain that you're asking about lightheadedness and fatigue. One example of a scale that you might utilize is the modified fatigue impact scale. There are others, and I believe that Julia later on um, um, in the presentation will probably discuss a little bit of that. The cardiovascular pulmonary um, uh, systems review, what you want to do on your clinical exam is it's this cannot be stressed enough across disciplines is looking at vital signs. And definitely, I know Heather already mentioned looking at the breathing pattern. Um, you wanna really focus on whether or not the, the person is using accessory muscles to an excessive amount. Um, and as you know, with Parkinson's disease, there's a lot of rigidity and often they can be very prominent in their um, accessory muscles already, but you definitely want to look to see if that is something they're doing. That's a sign that they're a little more stressed in their system. Um, you definitely want to look at their oxygen saturation. In fact, it's um, recommended that you might encourage people with Parkinson to obtain their own pulse oximeter. You can purchase them um, a home unit for $30, $34 on um, through Amazon. And um, definitely using that pulse oximeter to make certain that they're maintaining a saturation greater than 90%. 
Um, there has been in some of the uh, acute care listservs some comments about um, the accuracy at the finger for pulse oximetry. If you're in a facility where you are you question the pulse oximeter, the patient seems fine, but it's reading you know at 84 percent or something really low, but the patient doesn't have any symptoms. They you know you can consider using the earlobe um, or maybe a forehead. Um, sensor is another alternative to that. But for the most part, for most outpatients, the, the pulse oximeter would not be a bad idea to have and maybe utilize and, and spot check them as you're going through your maximal daily exercises or, thing, or any of the functional tasks or any of the activities that you're doing with them. Um, Heather already mentioned a little bit about um, the, the rapid breathing, but keep in mind that if their heart rate is elevated, it's also one of the signs of a pulmonary embolus in, in addition to chest pain and, and shortness of breath. So you want to keep in mind that the blood pressure um, can be both elevated and, and, and drop low. So you want to monitor that both blood pressure and heart rate, if at all possible, in your patients. Um, I would, if possible, encourage your patients, if you're going to continue to work with them on a regular basis, maybe even encourage them to use a Fitbit or some sort of um, a, a Apple Watch or whatever, something that they will monitor their heart rate as they, as they are going through the activity so that you can make certain that if there are, let's say they are, their system was stressed with COVID, that they're the response that you don't take them through an activity that gets them above their target heart range for safety. The other thing that I think is really important is that rate of perceived exertion scales, um, such as the Borg or modified Borg scales, and um, you know, can they converse and are what level on a zero to 10, if you use a modified Borg scale, are they at when they do a different task? So training them to, to target different levels and to know what, how stressed they are as they're doing different tasks is very important. To, to look at their, um, just to document their endurance, because we know that COVID does impact their um, endurance across all patients, is you might wanna do a simple thing such as a two minute walk test. Um, if a, somebody could not walk, just a, maybe a repetitive sit to stand test, like a 30 second stand, sit to stand test or something like that is an alternative to that test or a step in place test for two minutes if they can't walk. Um, monitoring signs, this is very, very important of um, venous thrombus embolus, emboli and both DVT and pulmonary emboli. And the, there is a clinical practice guidelines that, and the reference is the Hillegas reference there in 2014. I strongly recommend that um, every therapist have access to that and have it available because it will give you the tools in that clinical practice guideline that talks about how to screen um, and determine like clinical decision tree for both PE and for um, DVTs. Um, as well. Okay, so cardio, uh, other cardiovascular pulmonary treatment considerations to con keep in mind is you're going to want to think about techniques to facilitate clearance of secretions, okay, assisted or simulated cough maneuvers, um, and the, uh, again, piggybacking on what Heather had said about um, coughing and making them most effective. And we all know that physical exercise and, and mobilization of the body throughout space is very important to help clear secretions and to get that um, stuff up and so the patient can um, get it cleared and have a productive cough. Um, one thing that you want to consider that if somebody is either active with COVID or, or even post-COVID, or actually I think it's good practice in general, is just to position yourself out of the line and cough. So um, perhaps maybe sitting at their side versus right directly in front of them, if at all possible. Um, and then you want to consider about when you're doing exercise, such as the maximum daily exercises or the maximal functional daily tasks, you want to make certain that you're incorporating optimal breathing mechanics and coordinating that and really taking a focus on that, since especially the scarring that Heather mentioned, it can take, as she said, three months to a year for that to um, uh, re get back to pre-COVID levels. They're going to need to work on those mechanics and really work on coordinating breathing in activity, perhaps maybe more so than we did in the past with this population. And of course, you're going to monitor their symptoms and their vitals.
Um, so the, and now I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about musculoskeletal considerations and some things you're going to ask about in, and consider during this subjective exam. Um, one of the signs of COVID, a symptom of COVID, can be um, muscle aches. Now, the challenge here is that in Parkinson's disease, pain and muscle aches can also be present. So um, especially if there's dystonia or something like, uh, along those lines can often cause muscle discomfort as well. So you have to be able to ask, as Heather suggested, is to ask, what, did you have this type of muscle ache prior to the COVID infected infection? Um, and if not, it might be new, but also keep it in mind that if a patient that you're currently working with that didn't have COVID start to have, has muscle ache, have muscle aches, that's something that you wanna be on the alert for as well. The other thing you wanna keep in mind is you wanna ask about their medications they're taking because if a person is taking a corticosteroid um, orally for, let's say they're having um, uh, severe osteoarthritis issues or, some, or rheumatoid arthritis issues, um, and they're taking um, corticosteroids for that, they, they might have a reduced immune response, and therefore they, their risk factors for COVID are obviously greater. Um, the one thing that, um, and I know it's out of the scope of most of our practice, acts to be able to describe and prescribe and, and, and manage medications, but if a patient is on an, an, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication that has been shown to be linked with more severe forms of COVID. So if you're working with somebody that they end up with a, you know, maybe they you know, have a little ache or pain and they say, oh, I'm gonna go home and take some um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, medication, they may have not been educated that that maybe isn't the best choice. They could take acetaminophen, which is Tylenol. Um, that is um, something that, according to the literature, has deemed to be safe to take. And then I wanted to just bring out, if somebody happened to have a comorbidity of a rheumatic conditions, such as rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, they may not be able to get their medications due to a shortage related to COVID-19. Um, um, so they may have flare up of their symptoms. And so as you're doing activities with them, they might have increased discomfort and pain. The other thing is, let's say a, a, a patient was gonna have shoulder surgery and that might've been delayed because of, or deferred because of, of the COVID-19 um, pandemic in general and, the, and all the alterations in our activities, most of, everyone has been um, participating in. So keep in mind that they may, that may require, you wanna ask about them, were you planning on doing any, any of the uh, surgeries or have any treatments that you weren't able to continue with during this treatment? And then the other thing you wanna ask about, if they had been in the hospital and they were intubated or not, you wanted to ask out if they had been participating in any proning. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about more about why that is an issue. And one of the biggest things from a um, systematic review for musculoskeletal considerations when you get your patients is you're gonna look for ICU-acquired weakness. That's very common, especially in those patients that have been ventilated for quite a while. Um, they t uh, could be due to critical illness myopathy, polyneuropathy, Guillain-Barre syndrome. There's different things that could potentially cause that. But you wanna make certain that you're looking at strength assessments and screening patients with Parkinson's post-COVID that they um, look, look for um, strengthening such as like a simple test would be a five times sit to stand just to know if they have functional strength to get up. Um, to combat ICU weakness, you wanna be thinking stretching and strengthening such as doing LSVT big maximal daily exercises and you wanna work on mobility training. And keep in mind that they often will have decreased exercise capacity. So again, that monitoring is very important. And you wanna make certain that you're focusing on um, the range of motion of all their joints, because we know with Parkinson's, the rigidity and the hypo, uh, bradykinesia and hypokinesia will limit their movement and, uh, already. And then having been in ICU and on the ventilator can and certainly exacerbate that. So the reason I wanted to bring up proning is that there are a lot of sequelae that can potentially occur with if somebody has been in proning. And when they prone a patient in the hospital, the point of it is to, to make there more capacity in the actual physical, physical room for the person to breathe. And it basically gravity, using of gravity to move other organs and stuff out of the way and around. 
And basically they're on, on their stomach for 12 to, um, to 16 hours a day. And what happens is if, they're, if they can turn their head, they'll put their head off into the side, well, they get a lot of intraocular pressure. And we already know that people with Parkinson's disease have visual challenges often, you know, difficulty with blurry vision and, and um, uh, some different things such as that dry eye, et cetera. And so just being aware that they may have a worsening of their visual symptoms if they had a, a, a proning. Um, while they were in the hospital. So asking that question is really important. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is that when patients are prone to, for that long, they get limited in their oral care. And we know that people with Parkinson's already have trouble with their oral care in many cases due to rigidity and difficulty getting in there and, and, and other things, which I'll defer to our speech therapists that are much more knowledgeable to that. But, um, but it does limit their ability to receive oral care. So we want to keep in mind that that may also be an area that they might have difficulty with post-COVID. Um, not to mention the pressure injuries, um, um, any of the bony prominences, forehead, ears, zygomatic arch of the face, um, even on the neck they're talking about, um, potential uh, compression neuropathies, which will lead to foot drop. Um, sometimes even sublux subluxation of the shoulder can occur. Neck stiffness, which we know our population with Parkinson's disease already has a challenge with, and other various brachial peripheral nerve injuries, such as brachial plexus and perineal nerve injuries that we would want to screen for um, um, if they had that proning activity. So this is just a summary slide. Heather's already touched on this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but 36 to 40 percent, depending on the article that you look at, of people post-COVID develop some form of neurologic sign. So in a population such as Parkinson's disease, where they already have many of these types of things like the loss of sense of smell, the unstable gait, um, they may already have um, depression and apathy, those sorts of things, mental status changes, et cetera. Um, we just want to keep in mind that those are, the, all this entire list are things that we want to keep in mind might occur. And um, uh, specific to people with Parkinson's disease, if we look at the neurological considerations, it definitely, people with Parkinson's have shown, if they have COVID, that they have worsening of motor symptoms. And I know Cynthia, at the beginning, Dr. Fox kind of mentioned that already. And, and it's a very important thing to keep in mind. All the motor symptoms that they currently have could potentially be exacerbated or worse. Um, I just wanted to bring up a study that was done in India where they looked at um, uh, 100 people with Parkinson's disease. And they perceived that um, they had worsening or new symptoms. Um, it was pretty significant. 11% of people with Parkinson's perceived they had worsening of, or new symptoms related to their Parkinson's. And their caregivers are, were about 10% that they perceived that they saw that. Um, the other thing about people with Parkinson's and COVID I want you to keep in mind is um, some, some medical offices were suspending the Botox treatments that are given for dystonia. And so they may have a new or more difficult um, movement pat problem than they did before because they mainly due to an ability to get the treatment that was managing it. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the in-hospital complica complications of delirium and things like that because we have um, Dr. Ramage coming up and she's going to do a whole section on that. But I also wanted you to keep in mind that some people with Parkinson's may have trouble getting their medications. So there's their impacts of, of not being able to get their medication might also be enhancing those challenges that they are experiencing. Um, other um, considerations consider the non-motor symptoms. There actually was a study of, of over 4,800 people with Parkinson's disease and they found that those who were exposed to social media, which it's really hard nowadays with all the information being thrown at us from COVID, really seemed to exas exacerbate their symptoms of depression and anxiety. So um, just FYI, keep that in mind. It may be an opportunity for you to discuss maybe limiting those the information flow for people with Parkinson's disease. And um, we also want to look at the neuromuscular, we want to ask a patient if they've had any changes in their gait, rigidity, functional mobility, and, and activities of daily living. And have they had any um, 
dizziness, seizures, changes in thinking or memory, those are all important things to look at for the neuromuscular system. Um, it's important also to keep in mind caregiver health because this can be very stressful, not only on the person with Parkinson's who's had COVID, but also their family member. Um, that the lack of being able to, be, the, the forced social distance, not even able to be with them for some period of time, and then the stress of caring for them with their new challenges. Um, ask about their access to meds, we've already talked about that. And um, uh, consider depression and anxiety screens because we know that this is uh, something that can be really prob a problematic. And one example would be the hospital anxiety and depression screen. I believe that um, further on in the webinar, we have some other examples coming up. Um, and then when you're looking at um, physically examining your patients, you're gonna look at their motor control and strength. Uh, are their muscles symmetrical versus asymmetrical? Now we know that Parkinson starts as an asymmetrical problem, but but is it greater than it was before? Um, is there more of an issue? Because if it's really asymmetrical, then you might want to consider it that the the neurologic complication, the stroke, and that sort of thing. You want to look at uppers versus lower extremities, um, proximal versus distal or diffuse muscle weakness. That could be the complication of um, ICU my, um, myopathy, um, for an example. You want to look at their hypokinesia and bradykinesia. Has it increased in what functional task is that now impairing? So you're going to be looking at this both from a, a strength standpoint, but also a targeted standpoint, but also during function. And then the coordination and quality of movement um, um, is definitely something that you wanted to uh, want to address. And specifically, we want to look for and screen for peripheral nerve injuries. The most common ones post-COVID that, that has been documented are the brachial plexus injuries, most commonly occurring due to proning. Um, so you'd want to screen um, the, the nerve roots C5 to T1, and then per perineal nerve or fibular nerve, as it's now called, I guess. Um, you want to look for foot drop and sensory changes related to compression neuropathy that can, can occur. Clearly, you want to do a cranial nerve screen, but do keep in mind that some systems, such as sense of taste and smell, are often already impaired in Parkinson's disease, but definitely want to do a screen on that. Obviously, your range of motion assessment. And then you want to, it's very important, obviously, that you assess gait and balance. Um, and we have listed here a few different, the timed up and go, the, the Berg balance scale, the mini best test, the functional gait assessment are some examples that would be helpful. Um, to give you that baseline. And if you could compare to where they were before, if you have that documentation, it really gives you an idea for how, what their reserve they've lost and, and how you can build up to that in the future. And then also you wanna look at the activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living assessments such as the, the PASS and the Barthel Index and, and the Goal Attainment Scale. And let's see. That's the next slide. And next, I'm going to turn it over to Amy Radget Ramage, who will talk about the cognitive impacts of COVID-19. Hi there. So this is Amy, and um, I'm not always that fuzzy, but I'm going to talk to you today about uh, cognitive impacts with COVID-19. Um, when I had first started to hear about it, you know, you hear in the news about the respiratory system and ARDS being a big piece of what we're seeing in the population that are infected. Um, and for example, the 799 people who were seen in Wuhan, China, um, basically all of them had what we hear about in the news. They had fever, they had a dry cough, they reported fatigue, chest tightness. Um, some people reported anorexia or diarrhea, so other GI symptoms. A lot of them reported myalgia. Most also had um, drops in their O2 saturations below 93%. Um, of course, that sort of showed up in their bilateral chest radiographs that were um, abnormal. And basically, most of the patients who were deceased um, and a smaller number of patients who recovered from their infections had received mechanical ventilation during their stay at the hospital. What struck me though, as I read these papers, was that there were a small number of, of um, disorders of consciousness that patients had reported. About 22% of those who, were, who um, passed away and about 1% of those who recovered. What they were reporting was delirium, seizures, and altered consciousness on admit to the hospital. So 
that was um, sort of interesting to me to start thinking about what COVID-19 may be doing to the central nervous system. Um, and as I looked beyond just the idea that there is a shortage of oxygen being delivered to the brain, which of course the brain is, is very oxygen hungry, it wants that. So that was my first thought. But as I read more about um, this virus and other viruses like it, SARS and MERS, um, it became clear that it's not only the drops in saturation and drops in lung function that are impaired in people with COVID-19 infections, but also what has already been mentioned, this hyperinflammatory system activity where um, the entire inflammation um, of the, all of the organs in the body are seemingly becoming involved in some cases. Um, there's also the potential that the virus itself may be entering the central nervous system through the olfactory bulb and the nasal cavity, um, which would explain the symptoms that have been talked about previously um, of a lack of smell or anosmia. And then the other thing that's been mentioned um, is hypercoagulation that seems to be related to the virus. So um, this is an interesting piece that um, we may have not, I know I had not really thought about that and it is something specific to this virus, its effects on the, the lungs and causing an increase in those um, blood clotting factors in the, in the body. If there's one silver lining to this virus, it is that to most of us as um, clinicians, at least are knowing what to expect with stroke. Um, we don't know as much about these other factors, and so I'm going to focus on those a bit. So acute respiratory distress system, sy syndrome um, has been reported in about 100% of the patients who come into the hospital with COVID and in 100% of those who passed away in Wuhan, but it was only seen in about 16% of recovered patients. Um, so it's definitely um, High, has a high morbidity rate, but um, people are recovering from ARDS. Um, but people who have ARDS are at an increased risk for cognitive impairment. Um, about 70 to 100% of critically ill patients who had prolonged durations of hypoxia or were on mechanical ventilation were cognitively impaired after discharge from the hospital. And what's surprising is that that cognitive impairment persists in about 20% of those patients even five years later. Um, so this is, this is kind of an interesting piece. It's not specific to COVID, but we do know that in COVID, we're seeing hypoxic encephalopathy in about 20% of the at least the deceased patients who were seen in Wuhan, China. So what is this causing? Well, one thing is that this inflammatory system activity that we're seeing in COVID-19 is basically firing up our immune systems and causing what's now being referred to as cytokine storms. This is um, cytokines are the proteins that travel through our blood system in the attempt to fight off infection. And what we're getting essentially is friendly fire. So that cytokine storm is causing damage to the lungs, the central nervous system and other bodies, uh, other organs in the body. There was a recent paper that I found quite interesting uh, reporting on just one case. It's a female in her late 50s. She um, was admitted to the hospital with severe presumptive COVID-19. She had a cough, fever, and an altered mental state. Um, with some radiological assessments, it was shown that she had what is called acute necrotizing encephalopathy. This is a rare con complication of influenza and other viral infections, but essentially is a result of these cytokine storms. So it's causing a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier and allowing the storm essentially to enter the central nervous system. It's resulting in multifocal lesions, particularly of the medial temporal lobes and the thalamic um, cortex. So these arrows here in this brain image are showing you in that patient where she had hyperintense um, and ultimately damage of the thalamus and the medial temporal lobes. The other factor that we talked about was the hypercoagulation in patients with COVID-19. So we, this started to come out in the media after that surge of infections in Italy, where there um, were reported increases in the coagulation factors. So this increase in blood clotting um, appears to be a infection related and actually um, a result of chronic inflammation that causes an increase in fibrin, and this is a protein that's part of um, this cl blood clotting condition. And uh, it was mentioned previously that this may be seen in labs um, through the D-dimer lab counts. 
Um, but basically that fibrin um, spills over into the circulatory system and results in arterial and venous thrombi, um, myocardial, myocardial infarctions and strokes. And so we're seeing more of that in cases, and as was mentioned, even in cases where the infection was not very severe. So what basically happens in ICU cases where there is either a lack of oxygen, um, a inflammatory cytokine storm, or um, potentially also in the vascular system, we're seeing delirium. This is what I've seen reported, at least in the listservs that I, that I look at, the brainy, brainy listservs. Um, so what is delirium? Delirium is a cytokine-mediated activation of microglia and astrocytes in the brain. And it's associated with acute brain dysfunction. There are several different types of delirium. One is hypoxic, which we've talked about. Um, one is sedative-related. And what's in interesting to keep in mind is that sedative-related uh, delirium may be reversible. That is, when people stop taking the sedatives, they, they may become more lucid. Um, the issue is, of course, that people who are really sick and in critical care on ventilators are often also sedated. So we're seeing a mix of types of delirium. There can also be um, delirium associated with the inflammatory system and then other vascular and metabolic changes that can occur with the illness. What seems to be common across all of these types of delirium, at least in the ones um, other than sedative related, is damage to the medial temporal lobes the thalamus, and the caudate and striatum. Um, and so this is gonna have some major impairment potential for cognition, the medial temporal lobes being very important for memory, the thalamus being involved in um, lots of cognitive functions as well as in somatosensory um, functioning. So what we're seeing is cognitive impairment across the board um, with executive functions, memory, and attention potentially impaired. And then linking to that is the potential for mood disorders. And as was mentioned before, a lot of people with Parkinson's and a lot of people who are critically ill prior to um, becoming infected already may have some of these impairments. But when we see it after stay in the ICU, that um, sort of uh, constellation of symptoms is, or symptoms is referred to as post-ICU syndrome. And I think that that is really what we're starting to see as the cognitive output from this, this, this infection. So what do we see in delirium? Delirium um, is very predictive of cognitive impairment even um, up to 12 months after discharge. So someone who has had delirium in the hospital in ICU is very likely to have cognitive, cognitive impairment that persists. Um, there have been some big studies done showing not only um, declines on mental status exams, like the mini mental status exam or the MOCA, <clears throat> um, but also on more comprehensive assessments of cognition, like the repeatable battery for the assessment of neuropsychological status, where um, people with delirium, not COVID, but with delirium, are having difficulties, particularly across um, multiple test, subtests of the R bands, which make up the global cognitive score. So at three months and even one year post-discharge from the hospital, they're showing um, declines on the, that test. Um, so there does appear to be a, a high risk for the association between delirium in the hospital, particularly in pe people who are mechanically ventilated and have the potential for hypoxia, as well as those with the system systemic inflammatory activity um, that we're seeing in people with COVID-19. So it's very likely that what we're gonna be seeing in the next few months is patients who are wondering why they can't remember or why they don't feel like they're thinking the way that they did before. There's so many factors that, that may be um, coming into the increased delirium that we're seeing in people specifically with COVID. There's a very big, um, nice new um, set of papers that came out in um, physical rehab that's showing a lot of the factors that may be con, um, contributing. One is, uh, or a lot of these we've actually already talked about, but one is that when we are in the hospital and are not allowed to have visitors, um, people become confused, they are disconnected, they are feeling isolated, and they're suffering socially. Um, and so what can we do about that? We can try to help and reorient patients. We can try to bring the family in through video calls 
and really considering family-centered care so that people aren't feeling quite as isolated. We can also um, recognize that with the influx of many, many patients in hospitals, um, there are limitations to non-pharmacological interventions to control pain and immobility. And so patients may be more sedated than usual. Um, and what we may be able to do for them is to go in and work on in-bed mo mobility, um, as well as keeping up with regular assessments of their pain and agitation levels and their delirium. There's also uncertainty that we all are feeling, but certainly those of us um, who may be infected with this disease are feeling uncertain about the, the global pandemic. And so this is gonna to contribute to anxiety and depression and the potential for PTSD as well. So providing psychological support and reassurance. Um, people are feeling separated from their religious and spiritual services, which also increases fear and anxiety. So you know, there are ways that we may be able to provide technology that would allow people to take part in those, those rituals that they're used to being involved with. Um, the workload that people are having that are working out in the field um, is immense. And so when we have an overworked uh, healthcare system, everyone's feelings potentially burned out, may have a lack of empathy. And so we all need to be mindful of that, um, taking time for ourselves so that we can really be there for our patients, um, providing them support and practicing empathy. And then the piece that I really want to push today is evolving neurocognitive dysfunction. So when people are in ICU, it's not usually whether or not there might be cognitively impaired later that's on the fresh, fresh on the minds of everyone. But I think that we as professionals working with them can at least be noting these things. So our previous two speakers talked about noting, um, you know, things that are um, associated with mobility and breathing. But I think we should also be making sure to note um, someone's ability to express their emotional needs as well as any behavioral disturbances that they can be showing. So again, assessing and following up, but um, not just for pain, but also considering confusion and other factors. What do we know about the long-term outcomes? Well, in COVID, we really don't know. We do know that people who go through post-ICU syndrome um, do tend to have problems up to a year later. Um, those who are medically fragile prior to entering the ICU have a higher risk. Those who have had cognitive impairment um, before they went in, obviously that increases the risks. But people with PICS or the post-ICU syndrome do tend to have um, persistent problems with that. And along with that cognitive impairment is a difficulty with depression and just the disability. So it's sort of a, a round, all the way around issue. Um, and one study, fairly recent study of delirium has shown that people um, are not, the patients themselves are maybe not able to report on their own cognitive sy symptoms as much um, because they're reflecting more on their depression and the potential for PTSD. So we need to be thinking about not only measuring subjectively what um, someone might be going through and what their cognitive systems are looking like, but also making sure that we get some objective measures of cognitive performance. Um, this is just a study that's been put out for, uh, it's a randomized control trial currently underway um, for delirium, status post delirium, where they're looking at the co combination of physical exercise and cognitive training. There are a lot of data supporting the idea that we should be doing both as early as possible with someone who's um, been to had a delirium episode and is now post ICU. Um, so I don't have any data to show you, but this is one that they're looking at that I would ask you to follow up with. And just a couple of scenarios here, um, assuming maybe a person with Parkinson's disease comes in. This is someone who's been doing really well. They're doing well on their meds. Their exercise was really great. Their voice sounded fabulous. And then they test positive for COVID-19. Um, they're in the hospital. They were not um, on a ventilator. They um, received oxygen through a nasal cannula. They were discharged to home with no fever for 24 hours, still feeling weak and sick, um, but really feels like they've lost all their gains that they had before they went in and before COVID hit. Um, they, likely as a result of that, they may feel depressed and saddened about those gains. I think one thing to do in a case like that is to provide some education about the need um, to take time to isolate 
even after the 24 hours in the hospital. Um, CDC is recommending up to three days um, and 10, at 10 days since the first symptoms. What we might want to do is rule out a cognitive impairment by doing some sort of mental status screen, either the MMSE or the MOCA. Um, but because this is someone who was doing really well before they went in, there's no mechanical ventilation and no delirium, it's, it's a, there's a very good chance that this person will be fine and be ready for treatment um, for voice and PT and all of the other things. Um, something I think we should always be thinking about is evaluating for potential mood disorders, particularly in someone who feels like they've lost all their gains. Another potential case, this could be someone um, who was stable but medically fragile and then gets COVID. They're hospitalized, intubated, mechanically ventilated, discharged to skilled nursing, feeling very weak, the swallow um, is a problem, confusion, cognitive impairment, and just generally fragile and feeling very isolated. What do we do about those? Well, <clears throat> critical ICU care, but there's now a potential for hypoxia, that we know that there's probably also the hyperimmune activity and the potential for hypercoagulability. Um, there may be persistent symptoms, and a needs, we know that there is a need for, assist, for continued assistive care because this person's in a skilled nursing facility. So I would recommend, again, mental status screen and potentially a more um, formal evaluation of executive functions and memory, maybe doing the R bands or the click it. Um, considering modifying treatment to support those weaknesses in memory and executive functions. One thing we know about damage to the parts of the brain that are showing to be impaired in these cases is that learning new things is going to be difficult. And so if we can just write down and make more permanent and salient what needs to be done in therapy, that's gonna help. And again, referring for a mood assessment. So again, um, just wanting to highlight the idea that we need to work interdisciplinarily to work with um, all everyone else, to work on educating patients and families throughout the continuum of care, providing outpatient therapy however we can to avoid isolation, um, consider subjective and objective measures of cognitive function, and then anticipate not only the effects of on voice and dysphagia post extubation, but also considering cognitive impairment and the need for modifications for those recommendations. The other piece that's being mentioned in other um, areas that are dealing with COVID patients is the need to prehabilitate, and that is to start documenting change as early as we can in physical and psychological assessments so that we know what's happening with the patient as they're evolving throughout that continuum of care. And then just remembering what everybody's going through at this time, it's not just the physical and psychological, but also potential financial and logistic impairment um, changes that can certainly factor into how well and how ready someone is for therapy. So I'm gonna turn this over now to our, um, to our other experts to talk about rehab considerations for people with PD recover, yeah, recovering from. Thank you so much. All right, so now Jessica and I are going to take this forward and look at addressing the non-motor symptoms and um, some physical sequelae as far as um, treatment precautions and considerations, as well as getting into some treatment tips for those LSVT patients that you might be seeing. So what's coming out is really that rehabilitation is going to be essential. So it's one thing for people to go through this infection, but then what's next? So maybe people that haven't had problems previously walking or talking, problem solving, you know, as, as she mentioned with all the cognitive issues, maybe even difficulties with activities of daily living. These may be issues that have come up now post-COVID that we need to address to get them back to their optimal function. So just like we know with our Parkinson's patients, pre-COVID, you know, we have a saying in our clinic that no two snowflakes are alike and neither are people with Parkinson's. And it's very true with this as well. So people with PD really have their own diverse symptoms, their presentation, the stage of their disease. And also we know now that so much that's coming out about COVID-19 is really diverse, both in the acute symptoms and the sequelae. And we still, for it seems like when I'm following this online in any way and in the media, it, for everything that we uncover and learn, it seems like there's something else that we don't know. So this recovery and rehabilitation is really going to be 
dependable upon all of the complexities and interactions that come out of the diagnoses and all of the symptoms that we see moving forward. So I think that you really have to approach this with an open mind. Um, we know all of the non-motor symptoms here, any of these can worsen post-COVID. So depression is a real problem for a lot of us right now, as far as anxiety, depression, sleep, um, and stress. So many of us are really having difficulty with stressors. We know that emotional stress can really increase motor symptoms. Um, it can also impinge on the ability of the dopaminergic medications, your Cinemat, your Eldova, to really help with motor movements. Um, the timing and intensity of these stressors seems to possibly impact the efficiency of exercise. So for people that are really trying to exercise and, and use that as a neuroprotective defense, it seems to um, throw a little cog in the wheel there. And we also know that if you put depression and chronic stress into the, the um, you know, the pool, so to speak, with Parkinson's, it seems that there's a neuroinflammatory environment. So we really need to make sure that we're looking at all of the non-motor as well as the motor symptoms with this. So depression, apathy, anxiety, you know, these are part of the non-motor symptoms that can really have an impact, especially right now. So the reductions in physical activity that a lot of people are experiencing, maybe they can't get to their, you know, boxing or exercise classes or not able to get out of the home and go and exercise as much can really um, interact with their chronic stress. And then that's going to, you know, interact with increased physiological stress. And we know that that's going to connect into more motor symptoms. So, and, and the efficiency of their dopaminergic medications to really work their magic. So it can have such a waterfall of symptoms and impact um, for quality of life. So that dopamine depletion is also going to impact the cognitive and motor and flexibility. And that is going to also have an effect on their ability to cope with new circumstances. And they're having this sense of loss of control and increased stress stress, so it really becomes a cycle that can be hard to get a handle on. So we do know that there's a lot going on. I don't know about you guys, but I've put on a lot of different hats recently. I've been doing online mindfulness classes, and I know with LSVT Big, we've been doing a lot more online exercise classes and education, and a lot of people are doing telehealth. So we're trying to you know, give everything that we can. So we want to really help people find more self-management strategies. This is going to be more more important than ever, that self-efficacy piece, so that they have tools to manage their stress, to really have coping mechanisms in place, and also keep up on their physical exercise, be it LSBT loud and LSBT big, is more important than ever. We also want to make sure that we keep an eye on the possibility of need to refer to psychology and psychiatry. So, how do we do this if we're, we're maybe doing telehealth or we're still engaging, doing some programming? It's so important that people are in active and engaged in tasks that are meaningful to them. That's what we're all motivated to do. Um, and we want to link whatever programming that we're doing, if we're seeing people for therapy, if they're returning and coming back to us, what are their goals? You know, what not what are our goals for them, but what do they want to be able to do? Um, what hobbies and, and passions and, and maybe past interests that they have that they want to incorporate so that they can really improve their function and participate in things that are enjoyable and really have that self-realization. So it's always important to utilize task-oriented um, activities and be client-centered in our treatment. And I think it can be really um, difficult at a time like this when we're so focused on a, quote, disease like COVID-19 and we can kind of miss the forest for the trees and lose the person. So we've got to keep a focus on that. So as we've mentioned earlier, a lot of people kind of commented on this. This might be a time if you haven't in the past um, to screen for mood and depression. Um, the Beck depression inventory is great. Um, the HADS, I think Trisha mentioned earlier, the hospital anxiety and depression scale. It's really nice because it takes a little snapshot of both anxiety and depression and then also the geriatric depression scale. And there is a long and a short form. So those are some great kind of quick measures you can do. 
Um, also, as far as LSVT big, I just wanted to throw this study in here and make sure that we mention that, you know, these were 23 people who participated in the four week intensive big program in an outpatient setting. And they did have improvements, you know, in their time up and go and functional gait and balance. But what was interesting is they also had improvements in their geriatric depression scale scores. So we know that this can help not only with, you know, improvements in motor function, but we could also help if people are having some changes to their mood and maybe some depression and, and quality of life, it could help with those as well. So fatigue, this has come up a lot. And we know that even pre-COVID, it is the most often reported non-motor symptom with Parkinson's. And it is the symptom that honestly, I think stumps the researchers and physicians and patients the most. Um, it can affect motiv motivation and really impact engagements in social settings, in therapy and exercise. It can be really hard for people to overcome. And we do know that it's not just physical, but often it can be cognitive as well. So if people are trying to concentrate to read or do activities on a computer, uh, maybe do bill paying, um, that can really become a problem with that sustained attention. And we know that it also can interfere with carryover of the treatment strategies and exercises, or maybe even you know, medication um, you know, setups that the doctors have put in place. And it seems to interact as well when we look in the research with freezing of gait and also vision. So it really does truly impact and make everything harder. So some ways that you can screen for fatigue, and it might be that maybe your person with Parkinson's had fatigue previously. Maybe now post-COVID, they're really having more fatigue. Um, there's some great screening measures here that you can do. I love the fatigue severity scale because it's quite quick to administer. Um, the Parkinson's fatigue scale gets a little bit more specific to Parkinson's. So this might be a time to really take a look at it and see if this is impacting the engagement, um, both in therapy and even in participation outside of the clinic for your individual as well. So some factors, we know that fatigue has been and continues to be a significant concern for people with Parkinson's. Um, and with COVID, you know, that's gonna be even worse. If they've had trouble breathing and there's impact to the cardio respiratory system, we're probably gonna see, or maybe they've been in the intensive care unit, more recovery time, possibly some real issues with fatigue now. And the one thing that really teases out in the literature is that exercise seems to boost energy for people with Parkinson's. Um, but we want to make sure, I think, at this time, a lot of times we tend to push a lot and, and really try to get people moving and going, but we may need to be a little bit more cautious, really consult with the medical team, um, do more of those measures to really check oxygen saturation, you know, heart rate, blood pressure, um, you know, check in with the doctor and, and also with, you know, our colleagues in physical therapy and speech therapy and make sure that we're, we're not pushing too much. We're really keeping the individual in mind. So some treatment tips for that, you know, definitely some additional breaks might be needed for the person to kind of rest and recover and also hydrate. Um, we want to make sure that we don't push too quickly and kind of safely progress across the exercises. I think using that, you know, rate of perceived exertion, as Tricia mentioned earlier, is important. Monitoring for those oxygen levels during the exercises. And we also want to look at, you know, is frustration or anxiety and stress getting in the mix too when we're doing exercises because that could also you know impact their verbal fluency if they're doing LSVT loud or definitely impact their motor symptoms so we want to really look at the whole picture at the whole person and we want to help the not only the patient but the family identify and use any compensatory strategies that might be necessary maybe for changes to attention or memory um, maybe they need some augmentative communication to reduce the impact of those um, um, cognitive linguistic difficulties and anxiety that could be creeping up and impacting, you know, not only their mobility or activities of daily living, but also their communication.
So some ways to address energy conservation. Uh, so, you know, look at kind of what activities are high energy and low energy. I sometimes have people rank them, you know, one to 10, you know, how fatigued they are. And, and if anything's over a, a seven or above, then we're looking at something that's high energy. If we're going at a five or below, we're more in a lower range and having them kind of alternate those. Um, looking at more difficult activities and maybe using rest defensively, so taking that break beforehand, but then also encouraging the use of rest breaks if someone feels that they are becoming short of breath or fatigued during a task. We might need to really encourage people to delegate, you know, more strenuous tasks and ask for help. They might even need some resources in the community like Meals on Wheels, you know, if, if helpful. And we want to really look at their sleep hygiene too. So getting a consistent sleep and wake time, that might really be thrown off if they've been hospitalized and setting a bedtime so that they're going to get at least seven hours of sleep and making sure that we're getting that daily exercise in a dose that is really helpful for them and safe at this time for recovery. So at, with that, um, as we're looking a little bit more to if someone's ready for therapy, I'm gonna hand it over to Jessica. Great, thank you, Julia, for clearly explaining some of those rehab and prehab considerations for people with PD across these different severity levels of post-COVID-19 conditions. So I what I want to talk about now and, and discuss with you are some special considerations for these intensive exercise protocols of LSVT Loud and LSVT Big post-COVID-19 recovery. So if you have a patient who's recovered from COVID, you first want to consider all of these long-term and short-term speech, respiratory, the musculoskeletal, central peripheral nervous system changes that you've heard about from all of these experts here this evening, as well as that new wealth of information that's coming out from day to day uh, from experts around the world. And to really ask ourselves if our patients are ready for these PD specific therapies, which by definition have proven to be the only mode of delivery effective for these long lasting changes in people with Parkinson's. So it's likely that a, a person is not going to be a candidate for intensive therapy and may benefit from prehabilitation if they're too deconditioned and weak from the illness and they need bed rest uh, before being able to tolerate a seated position um, for a, a certain period of time or a standing position. Or if he or she is just unable to participate in a full session due to things like low oxygen saturation levels, um, increased heart rate, blood pressures, um, pl blood pressure that's uncontrolled or difficult to control, or an increased respiratory rate that you're not able to help the patient manage within treatment. Essentially, if a person has more medical or therapy needs Needs to address first, um, that is the priority because, of course, in those cases, he or she is not going to respond to stimulability testing in the way that we would expect and may need some prehabilitation or measures to establish a tolerance for their Parkinson-specific needs. But there is good news. Many people post-COVID can begin their intensive programs right away pending medical approval. We've been seeing and hearing from clinicians uh, working with people around the, the country that people with Parkinson's have been able to tolerate their one hour sessions, sometimes with some more rest breaks needed, and always with regular monitoring of vitals, um, which we want to be stable with exercise. And these are necessary to participate in, the, in our intensive protocols. Our intensive therapy candidates um, really should no longer be dealing with their active infections and they should be medically cleared for therapy and respond to stimulability testing for the intensive programs. So if your patient's not yet a candidate for, for therapy, and in particular LSVT loud, there is still a lot to consider um, and address. So first, uh, for our speech pathologists out there, you want to prioritize dysphagia or any swallowing concerns the patient may have, as of course safe swallowing is essential, um, and take nutritional considerations into account. 
You'll also want to establish simple communication boards for basic needs, which may be helpful when a person cannot be heard due to that weak phonation, which is then could be asked, exacerbated with masking, as Heather Matt mentioned um, earlier in tonight's webinar. Boards can also be helpful if a person is experiencing pain when exerting effort or when is trying to speak louder. And a board also offers the, a person the ability to control his or her environment more easily and enables them to communicate more easily with their health professionals, their doctors, their nurses and therapists, their family, and can differ depending on their location. And I think importantly what Dr. Ramage was mentioning regarding the expressing of confusion or the impact of stress on, and emotional needs. Um, that's also extremely important and there's room for the on those simple communication boards to express that as well. Finally, we want to consider those respiratory therapies that may build strength and endurance prior to the intensive respiratory voice LSVT loud program, such as expiratory muscle strength training, and if the person is an LSVT loud graduate, he or she can use those daily exercises to build strength, to build that endurance over time to, until they are able to participate in the intensive protocol. So um, for those patients who have to live with tracheostomy post COVID, helping them to maintain care is vital. As Heather mentioned earlier in today's lecture, there are a, a number of current challenges that people face, including continuous access to care, um, there are some home care personal issues to consider. We have to consider that staffing has or can be affected as the outbreak continues to spread. The availability of passimere valves, of humidifiers for stoma com comfort, uh, PPE, et cetera, um, may be affected as supply chains are affected. And that potential need for rationing care of care is also a consideration for our patients who have to live with trach. But we can offer suggestions for optimizing health during this time, such as helping patients access resources to care and needed materials, helping people access mental health professionals when needed, referring out when necessary. All of these things are so important for this con continuity of care. And for those who are intubated, you want to follow or you want to allow that um, those laryngeal traumas time to heal. And if you're unsure, you may need to wait until those ENT evaluations are available and stroboscopies are permitted before proceeding with voice treatment. So as I mentioned, candidates who are not yet ready to initiate or resume their PD-specific intensive therapy protocols, they may continue or initiate this prehabilitation phase that we talked about earlier to, uh, this evening. And that can be short or it can be long in duration and it's very patient specific. So to build strength and endurance during this time, as clinicians, we can lower the frequency of sessions during, again, during the prehabilitation phase to less than four during the week or have a shorter session uh, that is less than an hour to build up to that desired gold standard protocol or four hours a week for four weeks. And while you do this, it's important to diligently monitor those heart rate levels, pulse oximeter levels, or oxygen saturation levels, RPE, respiratory rate, blood pressure, to make sure these vitals stay within normal limits um, and or that we are accommodating these needs by providing rest breaks, for example. For those PTs and OTs out there, exercises that include cardio, progressive resistance, stretching, balance, walking, and mo mobility training, these are all okay. And functional training of ADLs and IDALs are just as important. And they should be specific to each patient and should address the current needs um, that each patient may have, reducing stress, reducing frustration, really taking the time to educate our patients and families about the, the impact that fatigue can have on our system and the importance of managing those fatigue Fatigue, that um, those fatigue levels and 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 conserving our their their energy, um, engaging in in proper sleep hygiene and mindfulness, as Julia stated, these are all important in the care of the whole person and to ultimately maximize treatment outcomes. And of course, care partner training or caregiver training and education is also key during this time. We've got to really help people establish the understanding, empathy 
the ability to provide better care and support for their loved one with PD um, who can also help the patient. And then of course, we've got to establish a daily exercise, a habit of daily exercise to help patients build endurance and then ultimately comply with intensive protocols. And of course, we have to regularly communicate with other team members on goals and progress towards goals. So we're maximizing efficiency of treatment and providing best care. So if your individual is coming to see you um, and he or she was a previous LSVT loud or big patient, and is returning for tune-up sessions or refresher sessions kind of, but needs to be addressed post-COVID, you'll want to reassess their performance on outcome measures, compare the, that data to most recent discharge scores or where you left off in the protocol, then reassess the current level of motor functioning, their sensory calibration, and the need for rescaling of amplitude to determine where in the protocol you have to resume activity. Then if the patient is nearly back to their pre-COVID baseline, or maybe they had a milder case of COVID, I have one of these patients currently, they may be um, immediately ready for a more intensive or, or um, established readiness for more intensive PD-specific therapies. Um, so to ensure or feel comfortable moving forward, you may want to consult with the medical team for approval, but uh, many of these patients with milder cases can do well and jump right back into their intensive uh, therapies. Our patients do need ongoing rehabilitation, as Dr. Um, Brown mentioned earlier tonight, even without COVID-19, but they need it even more to help them restore function that was lost as a result of the illness. So these intensive programs are especially helpful for our patients with Parkinson's at this time because they've been designed to meet the rehab needs of those who've experienced this illness or prolonged hospital stay, but they're still not able to return to that PLF, that prior level of function, or their ADLs. And as certified clinicians, we are well positioned to provide these intensive LSBT programs for people with PD, again, supported by over 30 years of research. So <clears throat> if your patient is stimulable for that program, then during the assessment or reassessment, they should demonstrate that ability to move with greater amplitude and speak with greater loudness. In addition, they want to demonstrate or you want them to demonstrate that these bigger movements or louder voice with better quality. We want more efficient voicing. And we want that person to be able to participate in a one-week trial of LSVT Big or LSVT Loud. The reason why we want that one week there, the reason why I state that here, is that there may be a time when you might be on the fence about the patient's ability to tolerate the intensive protocol. And in these cases, you want to have your patient go through that first week of treatment, assess progress at the time, assess those gains, assess the tolerance, and you... Uh, many times can be surprised, then decide from there as a team about moving forward with the remainder of the program. If rest breaks are needed uh, to, to tolerate the hour, that's okay. The need for rest breaks doesn't eliminate candidacy. In fact, you may see that fewer rest breaks are needed over time as that treatment plan progresses. And importantly, keep in mind that the functional goals that are salient um, that are created and are salient to each individual patient are so important as people recover from COVID and battle their PD because things may be different with their ADLs due to social distancing and isolation and other COVID requirements. So we can't underestimate the importance of monitoring vitals, pain, subjective reports of general responses to treatment, medication side effects, reports of confusion or stress, emotional needs, medication um, on and off times, which can so greatly affect motor performance and cognition, the quality and the accuracy of voice and whole body movements, um, overall safety, swallowing safety and balance. And we want to be careful not to deviate from that gold standard approach that we know um, works so well in the LSVT therapies, but we do want to accommodate what is needed for these post-COVID patients. So adaptations to the protocols that are acceptable include increasing the number of repetitions performed, but for shorter durations, requiring decreased respiratory support, thus lessening the load, or an LSVT big having the patient perform a decreased number of 
repetitions of the LSVT big exercise with decreased hold times and allowing for a greater number of rest breaks, as I mentioned, to address that fatigue during both protocols is also acceptable. For speech pathologists, staying at those phrase or sentence levels of the hierarchy when needed is okay for those who are slowly building endurance in those areas, and then increase complexity and length when you're able. And things like utilizing a seated or supine versus standing positions for LSVT beg exercises, um, building family, I'm sorry, bringing family or other types of support systems in to facilitate carryover, and then adding additional sessions and more frequent follow-ups are approved adaptations to maintain fidelity of the protocol. But on the other hand, unacceptable adaptations include those that alter the core protocol, change treatment tasks, or eliminate core elements, such as the specific treatment target, the intensive mode of delivery, or intensive calibration. Delivering fewer sessions per week or shorter sessions each day are also not acceptable during the intensive protocol. Those adaptations should only be used during the prehab phase when a patient's building strength and endurance to be able to participate in the intensive. So be sure to address all of those cognitive concerns Amy so clearly defined and outlined earlier in the webinar. We've really got to maximize success for our patients with our cognitive difficulties. So to do that, she made some great um, suggestions in the beginning um, or earlier this evening, and you want to make sure your patients have access to other things like um, a nice treatment room, or sorry, a, a room where they're practicing within that's separate from others with a few distractions as possible. On the clinician end of things, we've always got to remember to model exercises as we want the client to perform them. As we know, modeling is key for our Parkinson's population. Also use environmental cues and don't be afraid to repeat as much as needed. It's an essential principle of neuroplasticity. And just remember to keep your focus simple, especially when other communication and motor deficits are present. We've got to consider that the actual treatment setting and the manner by which one is delivering treatment is important. The first consideration is location. So for example, is your patient at home? Are they in a sniff? And if this is the case, is the clinician allowed to be able to safely see the patient face-to-face -face at home or in the facility or not? We also want to consider whether in-person treatment, even if allowed, is necessary or is beneficial. For speech pathologists, if in-person visits are necessary, ASHA recommends that employers provide you with adequate protection from droplet transmission during the AGPs, those aerosol generating procedures, and that's voice therapy, consistent with CDC recommendation guidelines for personal protective equipment. So you want to make sure that you and your patients are protected, but also consider things related to PPE such as whether your patient um, can see you, uh, can see your face or you can see their face. For speech pathologists, we've got to also think about how volume is affected, how data is collected when wearing masks or when behind plastic guards, and what the impact of the mask is on breathing during exercises, um, which leads us to another important consideration, which is whether or not intensive exercise is safe with the mask on. So in terms of telehealth or telepractice, which is ASHA's go-to term for online therapy, it, there are pros and cons, as we're all aware at this point. The pros include better access to care, especially for those in rural or difficult to reach areas, greater convenience for people who have difficulties with mobility or accessing providers, enhanced patient comfort and ease, being able to receive treatment from home, better confidentiality, and reduced exposure to contagions. But cons include reduced safety. Our PTs, our OTs have no ability to physically assist patients, which is a huge concern. And there are so many, there are more limited assessment options when online versus when face-to-face. -face. Those online treatments may not be reimbursable, and an individual or a clinician may be faced with technology challenges, uh, limitations to access uh, to technology and effectiveness of available treatments. So what you see listed here on, in the, on the next few slides are some telepractice or telehealth resources available for the general public. Um, and now more than ever, we really have to 
um, we have to be that positive, persistent, supporting and motivating energy our patients need. Because like this LSVT clinician stated, our patients are going to see the positive results from our therapy. They will hear the positive results from others. And as a result, their confidence will increase. And this will impact their ability to cope with anxiety, depression and apathy better than they could before. But of course, we've got to know when to refer to our mental health providers and other med medical providers, because we are only just beginning to learn about COVID-19 and each patient's response to treatment. And as I allied health professionals, we have to remember what this clinician is trying to express. We are the eyes and the ears for our nurses and doctors. We spend more direct time with patients, and this makes us more, so much more aware of so much more about a person, including an individual's non-motor symptoms. We need to be educated and relay information in a professional manner to maximize and support outcomes. So these next few slides are going to list some resources for therapists and patients related to particular topics. In your handout, you'll see a hyperlink of each resource that you can, uh, so you can access those resources. And there are ones specific to SLPs and patients with Parkinson's. And then lastly, I want you to be aware that the Parkinson's Foundation launched an Aware and Care campaign to help patients with Parkinson's get the best care possible during their hospital stays. So um, be sure to let your patients know about these aware and care kits. Um, this means they understand the risks associated with hospital stays. They receive the tools they need to empower themselves and their family so they can actively play a role in their care and be prepared for their hospital visits so their medications are handled and they're taken care of in an optimal way in that hospital. So to summarize, um, we know COVID-19 can have a wide range of impact on speech, respiratory, and muscul musculoskeletal and nervous systems in our patients with Parkinson's. And there are many, there are also many uh, possible cognitive and non-motor sequelae in patients with Parkinson's who have had COVID-19. So understanding these sequelae and may help therapists provide safer, more effective rehabilitation um, approaches and strategies to those who are recovering. Intensive therapies like LSVT Loud and LSVT Big may be an option for our post-COVID patients with Parkinson's. And boy, do we have so much more to learn as time goes on. So at this point, Laura, I'm going to pass the baton back to you and, and open us up for some questions. Okay, thank you, Jessica. And I just want to say a quick thank you to all of our presenters tonight for a wonderful presentation. I have learned so much from you. Um, I just wanted to give a quick message to our audience. Right now, we are at the top of the hour. Our presentation took us a bit longer, but I hope you really value the content that was presented tonight. Um, if you need to jump off and get back to your evening, uh, feel free to do so, and the survey will pop up so that you can um, request CEUs uh, and a certificate for that if you are a therapist joining us tonight. If you want to stay on for questions, we will stay on for at least 15 minutes of questions, and any that we can't get to, we'll follow up by email and send the response to the entire group. Um, so feel free to do what you think is best for you. As a review, there are a few ways that you can ask questions on your control panel. There's a question box. You can type in your question. That's probably the easiest. If you have a lengthy question or maybe you like to share something about a, a patient that you've seen recently that's post-COVID with Parkinson's disease, um, raising your hand might be a good way. Uh, just know that we have to unmute your microphone and make sure that your microphone is unmuted as well so that we can hear you. And lastly, if we run out of time for your question or if you think about something later, always email us. There's two ways you can contact us, either info at lsvtglobal.com or you can contact us at webinars at lsvtglobal.com. Um, either one is fine and we'll be able to take your questions um, either way. And so with that, um, we have a few questions that have come in already and so I'll start um, asking the presenters these questions if you wouldn't mind. Um, one question that came in that is really appropriate to all of you is um, would a lot of these considerations for the interdisciplinary team be pertinent in other neurological conditions such as, as MS? And 
Um, Jessica, would you like to take a stab at that first as a speech therapist, and then maybe we could have um, uh, Trisha and Julia chime in as well as PT and OT? Sure. Um, I think the answer to that is um, yes. Many of these interdisciplinary considerations, especially those regarding non-motor symptoms um, and fatigue and, and how we might address that as an interdisciplinary team, are, um, are uh, important. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I do think that it can be applied, you know, our, what we've recommended this evening can be applied to other neurological disorders and the atypical Parkinsonisms um, that uh, we, we frequently see, those with PSP and MSA, et cetera. Okay, great. Um, Trisha, would you like to add anything to that? Um, and Trisha, while you're working on your microphone, maybe Julia, um, do you have any other contributions to that question as an OT? Oh, thanks, Laura. I think that was perfect. I mean, with all, it seems like, you know, with most neurological conditions, I should say anyway, you know, there is generally some level of fatigue. So I think that's a big one with this and just the recovery and allowing for those rest breaks and, and really considering the whole person. And so I always think teamwork makes the dream work no matter what. And I look to my colleagues to help advise, you know, how best to really um, consider all elements of the the treatment to optimize outcomes and really the whole, always look at the whole person. So absolutely. And Julia, just to piggyback on what you're saying, this is Jessica, you mentioned um, earlier the, um, the impact that exercise can have in the opposite direction, how it can kind of, it, re it, it can invigorate the patient, it can kind of rev up their system in a sense. So I think there's that perfect va balance that we as PTs and OTs and, and SLPs kind of help patients find is, you know, those are that, is that perfect balance between the rest breaks needed to address fatigue and the push of the patient um, to really help them achieve those levels that they don't even know they're capable of, of achieving. That's such a great point. You know, that stimulation, especially if someone has been maybe bedridden or, you know, just not active even, we all know how that makes us feel. So for sure, that's a great point. Um, I got my microphone working now. Can I jump in there? This is Trisha. And I yes. just wanted to just say I agree with often that's awesome and yet definitely can apply to other neurologic conditions. I would just like to say that, however, in certain conditions such as MS, um, the respiratory complications may be more significant in that population depending on the level of the person. And so we may have to look at unique combinations based on the diagnosis, but the general side effects of COVID-19 that we want to watch and monitor for in our persons with Parkinson's disease are across the board. Excellent. This is Cynthia. And uh, Dr. Ramage, I have a question for you. Um, I know that we oftentimes uh, in our teams sometimes get a little too focused on motor sensory without perhaps enough uh, consideration of cognition, even for mild, not even considering severe. So, you know, what kind of mistake or what, or what, I don't know if it's a mistake, but what do you see that um, therapists in general um, don't do well enough or, or are missing or what's your pearl of wisdom that can help us um, be better about taking in those, those subtle cognitive changes that can help us improve um, the therapy we deliver? Yeah, thanks. That's a great, great question. I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, especially in something like COVID, cognition and, and language um, tend to not be the first thing on people's minds. And so just being aware of what may be going on, um, I think is what's really important. I think the key in, in terms of what you may be seeing in, in your cases with your patients is that they won't be able to in, take in everything you're giving them. And I think that's the, the piece that you wanna be most aware of. So um, that's where doing even just a little screen of, of like the MMSE or something may be able to give you an idea about that. 
But I think even when that's not the case, I don't know that we always think about making our treatment goals as salient as possible to the to the patient. Um, and so, and by salient, I mean just making sure that they know what it is that they need to be doing and making it incredibly clear um, how they can do those things potentially um, when you're not there to work with them. So writing things down, having really um, discrete steps that they need to follow, and just just having everything so much clearer so that they don't need to rely on their memories when so many other things are going on, um, not to mention that they may be having difficulty uh, making new memories, which is, is one of the biggest problems, I think. Um, and then, as mentioned before, thinking about attention and distractions in the environment, trying to limit that as much as possible, trying to find the ideal situation for doing therapy. Um, I think that it's, it's easy to overlook, but I think these are the kinds of things that can be affecting your effectiveness as therapists, your data as you're showing change over time, um, that maybe have nothing to do with what you're doing as a therapist, but just considering how much that person's able to, to take in at a given time, given the potential for these cognitive impairments, but also um, knowing that people who have a mood disorder um, and are going through so many things at one time, mm -hmm. aren't able to take in so much information. Hope that answered the question. Yeah, thank you, that's great advice. Just to add one thank more you, thing Amy. to that, Cynthia, this is Jessica, um, I'm finding, you know, we're treating a lot of people based in big urban areas like New York City, and with the um, self or with the isolation or quarantine requirements, we're, noting that people are needing a little more support with orientation um, and you know those just day-to-day -day orientation activities can be helpful for the for our patients right now as well since they're staying home um, and not performing their typical ADLs. Thanks Jessica that's a good point too. Um, this next question is a really quick one. I think, Tricia, you're probably the best one to answer it if I'm thinking back on the content. Um, the listener is wondering what the resource is on DVT slash PVT that you spoke of. Oh, it is in the references. It would be the Hill, Hillegas, FGH, mm -hmm. Hillegas at reference number 26. Um, supplement, okay. oh, no, 27, excuse me. Role of physical therapists in the management of individuals at risk for diagnosis with venous thromboembolism. It is a free article available through the Physical Therapy Journal. Um, so reference number 27 on the list is the one that is the clinical practice guideline that provides the, both the screening and a clinical decision tree for both PE and DBT. Okay, great, thank you, Tricia. Um, uh, another question was regarding uh, telehealth, um, really more specific to LSVT big and telehealth. Um, it's a great question and really relevant, of course, to this population um, that we're speaking of tonight. But for the sake of time, what I would encourage you to do is go back through those very last slides that Jessica presented that had some links to webinars that we've presented in the last few weeks related to LSVT Big and Telehealth. There is a free public one that if you're not LSVT certified that you can access um, through our blog. And if you are LSVT Big certified, you can also find one that's more specialized, more in depth through your LSVT Big clinician account. Um, likewise, if you're listening and you're a speech therapist, you can join the public one or the lengthier LSVT Loud Certified Clinician one that you can find in your clinician account. Um, Cynthia, anything else you wanted to add to that regarding our telehealth resources? No, I think that is exactly what I would have said. We we have those great webinars and um there's there's a lot of good stuff there and with lsvt loud you know telehealth has been around for quite some time and so we actually have good published data and of course the recent changes um with medicare coverage certainly opens the door for us to be able to provide telehealth services with greater accessibility to more patients 
Okay, perfect. All right, I think we will take a few more questions here. Um, this one is an interesting question. At this point in time, is there any particular setting that most PD patients are being referred to post COVID? And if referred to outpatient settings, what's the best way to maintain communication between disciplines to ensure optimal care? Um, always a challenge, I think, is communication between disciplines. And I think there's um, an intrinsic strength built in between LSBT teams, but who would like to jump in and, and just take a first stab at that one? <laughs> and oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Julie. I think you're great because you work in a hospital-based system where you work closely with PTOT and speech. So if you wouldn't mind, that'd be great. Sure, sure. Um, so I'm in an outpatient hospital-based setting, and definitely, you know, um, there's a lot of, of different um, kind of, I guess, strategies we use for communication. Often it's email. We do have inter-office communication as well that we'll kind of send each other messages or we'll send each other emails. Um, sometimes it's just catching up between, um, you know, visits with, with someone as well or even at lunch, but we definitely, are, you know, kind of keep in contact. And even right now, we're all out of the clinic for the most part. Some people are doing telehealth, some people are at home, and we've had a lot of emails going kind of around and, and back and forth and a lot of communication as far as plans of care and where we were with people and, and where to pick up. So I think it's just you kind of have to use whatever um, you have at your disposal and whatever works best in your setting, but you've got to really keep the communication open. Yes, I think that's a great answer. Um, you know, every facility and organization works a little bit differently. Um, and so it's really finding that sweet spot of what's most efficient for you within your organization. Um, let's move on to the next question. Have you heard of patients being admitted for a respiratory illness and their test for COVID-19 is negative, but they present with some of the signs and symptoms such as fatigue, musculoskeletal pain, mental status changes, especially in milder cases who did not need intubation, but maybe some O2 supplementation. Um, Heather, have you heard of any cases like that? Um, and Heather, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute your microphone here. Sorry about that. Um, make sure Heather, yours is unmuted on your side there. There you go. Great, um, thank you for that. Um, so can you repeat part of the, I know as people that are presenting COVID-like illnesses, but are coming back yeah. then. But the test for COVID is negative, but they still have symptoms of fatigue, pain, mental status changes, maybe some O2 supplementation. And so I would take a similar approach. You know, I think that if you are seeing these patients in person, um, we always want to err on the side of caution and using PPE, regardless of what their diagnosis may not, you know, may have, have revealed or not revealed. And I would go through the same types of screenings that we mentioned as far as what have they noticed has changed. Um, looking at respiratory rate, respiratory strength, um, perhaps talking with the physical therapy colleagues or respiratory therapy colleagues um, about manometry. I happened to work at a respiratory hospital for 13 years, so manometry at times was part of my my screening and, and workup with some patients with respiratory either coming off of an acute infection or those patients with more prolonged or chronic conditions, um, pulmonary or even upper airway um, in regard to, to laryngeal um, obstruction. So I think that it, if it were me, I would have a similar approach in looking at those patients through the lens of, gosh, you had a respiratory illness. It appears to not have been COVID-19, but you, sh you could still have the same manifestations and side effects. And so we need to really drive home that we're looking at the, the full 
whole person um, and whether it's affecting um, the speech system, the musculoskeletal system, the cognitive and linguistic symptoms that can happen and, and fall out. So yes, I would absolutely say that the same rules and the same principles can apply to such a patient. I hope that answered the question. Yes, I think that was perfect. And, and thank you, um, Heather. Um, just a quick logistic thing. Um, if your link isn't working correctly to the Parkinson's Aware and Care Kit, um, if you go to parkinson.org and in the search, search for Parkinson Safety Kit or Aware and Care, um, you should find that. We'll try to send out a, the correct URL as well. So apologize for that. Um, and it does look like we're about 18 minutes after the hour, and we have um, no other questions that have come in, but just to remember that you can always email us questions later on if you think of any questions. Um, we have a survey that should pop up at the end of um, the webinar after you log out, so please be sure to fill that out, present your feedback to us, um, there'll be information in there as well on um, how you can request a certificate and um, also indicate your discipline so that you get the correct um, uh, certificate as well. So with that, um, I want to thank everyone, especially our wonderful presenters for the amazing presentation tonight. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within about two days. So if you want to rewatch it, share it with colleagues or anyone else, you're welcome to do so. Um, and any last parting words, Cynthia, as we say goodbye. I'll just reiterate, thank you to our presenters. Thank you to everyone who is with us uh, here tonight. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and as things evolve, we'll continue to have more webinars um, to share more information as we learn it. Thank you, and good night.